um, thank you to Annette, Michael and colleagues um, for inviting us to contribute to this really brilliant seminar series, which I've been really enjoying and I know Fiona and Liz have too. Um, it's given us an opportunity to collaborate with each other, something you might think is fairly easy since we are all in the same institution, but, but obviously in, in lockdown that, that has been limited. So we're very grateful to have that opportunity to collaborate with each other and to think together. And we hope that that's what we will be doing um, in the rest of this seminar. And just to explain, I'm, I'm going to leave my camera off and just have my audio on as I, as I work through my slides, but I will turn my camera on later and obviously for the discussion. Um, so in this presentation, we're drawing on um, a piece of work by Liz um, Chesworth, um, where Liz applied three different lenses to a moment of play in an early childhood setting. I was very inspired by this piece of work because it really seemed to enable um, the reader to fully understand the different meanings that Liz was making in um, of the of the particular kind of moment that she was looking at. And this was in a in a uh, obviously a formal learning setting and we're looking at a home setting. Um, so we've decided to use a similar approach and this is really in response to the invitation that Annette and Michael gave us in terms of looking at the socio-material um, and looking at critical literacies and we felt that that was really appropriate to kind of it enabled us to kind of approach this with this idea of this three lens um, approach. Um, and we're using that to look at a moment of digital authoring from a project Fiona and I worked on together. Um, and these new lenses that we're using um, uh, are new literacies, new materialism, multimodality. Um, uh, what we, we're using in order to be able to reflect on ways that an act of digital authoring can be seen to constitute a, a critical literacy practice. But as you'll see, the, it's a very generative process so that we look at many other things also. Um, we do have a caveat, or perhaps I should own up that I have a bit of a caveat here, which is something that I um, have discussed in depth with Cathy Burnett, another of the um, contributors to this seminar series, and this kind of res relentless pursuit of the new, um, and Cathy writes about this in ways that are really interesting. Um, and sometimes um, I have this kind of anxiety that this is counterproductive um, and that we should be cautious of claiming something as new when it might just be new to us or to our discipline. Um, so we're, we're kind of approaching the notion of these lenses being new with some, some kind of caveats and some caution, particularly because what we think we're um, bringing or uh, what we think the use of these three lens does is enable us to see continuities um, rather than being able to kind of compare one lens as whether it's more um, effective or impactful than another. So, that, so this is a very kind of combinatory um, approach. Um, our theoretical lenses that we have chosen to use are um, uh, new materialism, uh, multimodality, um, and we use this to, uh, as I said, um, focus on uh, a moment of digital authoring. And this is from a project that um, Fiona and I worked on um, in relation, uh, which was led by Jackie Marsh. Professor Jackie Marsh is a much loved colleague at the University of Sheffield. Um, and this was a project funded by the Lego Foundation. And we're not going to talk in great detail about that. You can see that the research question led us to focus on children's use of technologies um, and their play in everyday life. Um, and we found much kind of rich evidence of um, the value of digital media in children's play. But um, we'll put the link to the report in the um, in the chat if people are interested in finding more. And what we focus on in this um, presentation is one moment of many, um, a, a, a piece of um, video data um, that we're um, going to look at in some depth. Um, and it's a, a piece of um, digital authoring from a, a child in a particular family. And I'm just going to share with you the, the portrait that was um, written in collaboration with the um, family. Um, and that were shared in the report. So Anna is seven and John is four and they're siblings and they live with mum, Marina, um, white British um, family living on a council estate near Sheffield city centre. And it's important to say that they were categorised in the study as being from a lower socioeconomic um, status family. 
Um, now, Marina, the mom, takes a really active interest in the children's play, and particularly that with technology. Um, they watch television after school and have a film night at the weekend. Um, Marina prefers educational apps and is not keen on YouTube, and it makes um, videos frequently, but certainly at the stage we were um, collecting data, um, gathering data, we were um, seeing uh, uh, sort of caution in, in Marina's attitude to um, the use of YouTube. But that's not to say that that wasn't a very media rich environment. Um, and it's um, important to, in terms of introducing you to Anna that this is a real snapshot. Um, she was a, a child with many, many interests, um, interest in pets, brownies, singing, dancing, digital media plays a role in all of these activities. Um, and it's something that all of her interests are very much shared both with her sibling and with her um, uh, her mom in particular, but also grandparents. And I think Fiona is going to touch on that later. Um, and in this in the moment happening, Anna is using a coloring in app and it probably doesn't seem like a very promising um, coloring in app. It's um, fairly simple. Um, and we think it's probably most sensible just to show you the clip, first of all, um, uh, in order for you to, we're then going to kind of talk through our analysis, but in order for you to get your own impression and see it at first hand. So Michael is very kindly going to share the um, clip for us. Great, okay, just give me a chance here to uh, select the video. I'll just. Uh... Is it on that app or? App. This app, you're in it. Oh, that one. What's it called? Play Kids. That's what it's called. That's it. Then at the bottom, I'll put red. I know it's going to be red and then... I like these sort of apps. Because mm. they are learning and... Mm. I've got red on yeah. there. Do you mean colouring in? Colouring in and I think it helps them with the colours. Yeah? I know! Has Abigail done a lot of these? I know you've shown us these before. Yeah. She likes she likes doing her pictures. So you ready? Just mm. pretend you've not sewn this way all yet, all right? Okay. Just pretend you've not sewn it. Don't do a magic trick. That's the magic trick. Do you mean seen it? So, so you ready? Mm. So you see this way all here? Mm. So disappear in a minute. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So, you ready? Mm -hmm. We rub it all out, but I don't want you to see the special bit. So. Okay. Ah. <laughs> this is what she does for me. She don't like me. Switch it <laughs> off. <laughs> then just close your eyes. Right. Okay, I'll close my eyes. I'll close my eyes while I'm still filming. What do you still look up in? I've still got my eyes shut. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <gasps> it's come alive. Oh my heavens, the picture's come alive. That is such you know a good trick. You know how I did trick. that magic trick? No, tell me more. Because I rubbed it out and I've already got this whale I buy it. Oh, I see. Is so is it just a coincidence that you found this on the app and it looks so much like your one? Yeah. Oh, it's great. Oh, what a brilliant magic trick. Have you shown this to Beth as well? Yeah. Oh, we've got the full effect then. <laughs> So I'm just going to share my screen again for a moment. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is just um, talk you through the um, approach that I took using this multimodal lens. Um, so I obviously there is a great deal of precedent and um, in, in terms of using multimodal um, analysis in looking at data um, of children's play. Um, and I drew on the work of obviously Gunther Kress, but also Rosie Fluitt, Cowan um, and Roberta Taylor. Um, and that's to name a few. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really grappled with when we were making decisions about how to transcribe and how to analyze the, the data 
um, is obviously the number of modes that um, could potentially be of interest um, in focusing on um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, really rich uh, moment. So um, I used the idea of um, salience, a kind of um, a key uh, term that, that Cress himself uses, um, to, to d determine really what, what's most significant, what's most of interest. Um, and so, um, as you can see, this is just a, hopefully you can see in the image, there's a kind of um, focus on the uh, action and the gaze in terms of multimodality um, and uh, the, we're looking at the um, participants language, um, but um, it's really important to acknowledge that we were also looking at what was going on on the technology, how the technology was being used and also um, kind of separate from that, the actual kind of media content itself. So the transcription kind of tries to look at all of those things. Now there's many, many more things that we could have paid attention to, but we've tried to kind of pay attention to the things that um, were most salient. Um, but but you'll, you'll see um, if you look at an example, so for example, uh, where mum says, um, uh, oh, that one, or um, I, I like these sort of apps because they're they're learning. There's lots that's that's missing from the um, the tone of what she's saying here. So I'm going to do a bit of a talk through of some of the um, key moments that we also looked at um, by taking one image at a time, um, because at the heart of what I was interested, I think what we were all interested in here was this um, really rich moment of a child's playful digital authoring. Um, but through this analysis, I became increasingly interested in the role of the parent. Um, and this was particularly the case during the pandemic when I was returning to the data to um, do some further analysis. Um, and in schools in the UK, and I don't know if this is true in um, Australia as well, but we had this huge uh, narrative, this huge discourse that um, of learning loss, that children being out of school meant that they were um, not learning and that they were going to need to be um, caught up. And I had some concerns about that, um, and particularly because this seemed to present um, what happens in lower socioeconomic status families as having negligible value. Um, and we've looked, so um, Fiona, who, who's going to um, talk shortly, has done a lot of work on parental mediation and has found really rich forms of parental mediation. Um, but when we were looking at this data, we felt that this was um, perhaps uh, something that um, gave us the opportunity to identify something that was going on in the way that children, uh, parents were supporting children's play um, that was worth further attention. So um, these moments that I've taken um, are just illustrative, really. Um, we're still looking at um, kind of considering which moments we should choose, because as you could tell, there were there were many. Um, so, uh, but what's important, if you imagine, you could hear the voice of the researcher. So mom and the researcher are sitting on the settee behind um, Anna and the, the light is off all the way through, as you could tell, until the very end. And that's because Anna is trying to um, set up this idea of the magic trick. So although she's doing the app and what she needs to do on the app, it's always in her mind. Now, at this stage, um, mom is focusing on um, helping the researcher, really. So is it, is it an app? So she's getting Anna to talk about the app and she explains what it is. Um, for me, Anna shows real mastery in her play here. She's building an, anti, um, an atmosphere of anticipation. She uses the register of a, a magician um, uh, in, in her kind of presentation of, the, of each, each moment. So she's explained, she steps in and out of the kind of fictional world and she's inviting um, the researcher and also mum to kind of join, join with her. Um, and although uh, here you can see, so mum says, I like these sorts of apps because they are learning. And obviously she's referring to the colours, colouring in, learning the colours. And this is something the researcher also picks up on. Um, but there's an awful lot more going on here. Um, and it would be, it felt really disingenuous to focus on what mum here was, was seeing as the value of the app being so, solely about colours, because what's also going on is this giving Anna the floor, giving Anna attention, positioning Anna as a child with um, 
possibilities, opportunities to perform. Um, and it was really clear as we were watching this that um, we were witnessing something that had happened uh, lots of times before, and it's mentioned um, several times that this, is, this has happened several times before. So, so mum's really facilitating Anna's play in really interesting ways. And here where Anna says, so this is kind of quite a Sheffield accent, um, grammatical uh, error, I guess you would call it, pretend you've not saw, saw this yet. All right, just pretend you've not saw it. And mum gently says, uh, do you mean seen it? Um, and, you know, if we were just looking at the transcript as a language here, we'd maybe see that as an admonishment, a correction to the grammar. But what, what it feels like um, as we were doing more of analysis of the moment is, is it's very supportive. It's, it's within the um, structure of a, of a practice that's, that um, is a, an, an ongoing practice where um, Anna is performing and mom is facilitating and maybe even mentoring and um, improving that performance. Um, and and it kind of feels over like a very co-constructed moment. And of course, Anna is um, very much in control. She's the expert and mum is allowing her this space. And this is quite distinct to, to, what, um, to some of the other forms of mediation that we saw. Um, and a particular moment where um, I, is that it was really significant to me is where mum says, um, this is what she does to me. Um, she don't let me look at it. And, and, and she's, again, this is how we were kind of getting this picture of she's referring to existing family practices, things that have happened multiple times. This isn't the first time. So it's an in the moment happening, but it's an in the moment happening that's been invoked several times. Um, and, and that um, seemed to be very interesting to us. Um, and then at the end, when she says it, it comes alive, it's come alive. For me, this was the most significant moment because uh, although that's a moment where um, Marina is checking that the researcher has understood and knows how to respond to Anna, um, she doesn't do it in an instructional way. She does it within the fictional world. So she is an audience member at a performance of a magic trick saying, it's come alive. She's believing that it's that it's com coming alive, and which is a, a very particular form of um, suspending disbelief in support of your of your child. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Liz, who's going to talk some more, and we're going to come back to some of the cross-cutting themes um, in uh, the at, towards the end of the talk. Thanks very much, Becky, and hello to everyone. Um, I, I must start with a caveat first, I guess, in that um, I'm, I'm fairly new to exploring um, ideas from new materialism. Um, I find the ideas um, really interesting, but also quite challenging. Um, but um, we're arguing here that they perhaps offer um, something helpful. They illuminate um, something that, that helps us to, to think um, in um, in enriched ways about children's digital authoring. Um, so I, I think I'm going to have to um, uh, ask you to, to, to be um, to, to assist here, Becky, if you don't mind, and, and move on the slides, if that's OK. Absolutely fine. <laughs> it's just taking a while. <laughs> I don't know Thanks, why. Becky. Sorry. Brilliant. Thank you. So, um, Thinking with new materialism um, requires these sort of fundamentally different ways, I guess, um, of, of thinking about the human in terms of this decentering of the human, thinking about people and their activities in a different way to those arising from, um, from, from Western philosophy that has often informed our thinking. Um, and these different ways um, really centre around this one plane of being, what's sometimes called this, this sort of flat ontology, in which human activity takes place in relation with, um, rather than authority over other materials and spaces and living things, all of those things that we've just seen within um, the, the multimodal analysis. So these relational ways of thinking about the world include inanimate things. So the tablets and the apps and the, the cuddly whale um, in, in the, the, the clip that we've been, been watching. Um, and according to new materialist thought, um, people like Jane Bennett, for example, talk about this idea of vibrant matters, um, vibrant matter rather, and thing power, where things like tablets and apps actually have potential to animate rather than being viewed 
as passive objects um, that, that humans um, manipulate. So this obviously requires us to think about concepts such as agency um, in really, really different ways and ways that I think a lot of us have sort of grappled with and found quite challenging um, in terms of early childhood studies and, and childhood studies more broadly. Um, because this way of thinking requires us to think about agency as being relational, something that is enacted rather than something that is possessed by, by individual people. Um, if you could move on, please, uh, Becky. Sorry to put this extra pressure on you. Um, now, for, for us and the discussions that we've had in our, in our, um, in our trio, um, we think something really important to emphasise within um, our interpretation of new materialist thinking is that this decentering of the human for, for us doesn't devalue the human. It just requires us to think about the, hu the human and, and, and agency in different ways where agency is performative um, rather than possessed. So we're not devaluing, and indeed we're doing the opposite in terms of really recognizing um, Anna's incredible ingenuity and imagination within this particular episode. But with a new, a new materialism reading, um, it requires us to think about Anna's imagination and in, ingenuity as activated as part of her entanglement with all of the other people, spaces and materials that make up this particular episode. In other words, the magic trick is something that is produced or co-composed within this dynamic assemblage that includes um, Anna as the girl, but obviously the tablet, the app, um, really interesting, I think, the way that, um, that Becky's analysis has drawn attention to the multiple roles played by Anna's mother within this assemblage, but also um, the researcher is part of that assemblage, the researcher's camera, the darkness of the room, and let's not forget the cuddly whale that plays a really important role within this trick. Okay, uh, next, uh, next slide please, Becky. Okay, so within this entanglement, everyone and everything is transformed. And it's that mutual transformation within this um, particular lens of thinking about this episode that creates the magic trick. So we can perform this sort of, this, this cut, I guess, through this particular episode to think about what's happening and how it's happening. So the coloring app and the cuddly whale sometimes suddenly acquire very different meanings. Um, the purposes of the app, which were to color in, are transformed and um, the coloring app interacts with the cuddly whale to become enchanted as an integral part of that trick. Um, with Anna becoming magician and with the mother and the researcher becoming the audience and so on and so on. So we think that this illustrates quite nicely this idea that Deleuze um, presented in terms of all bodies within an event, human and non-human, are causes, causes in relation to each other and also for each other. Okay, just move on to my final slide if that's okay. So all of this might be very sort of intellectually stimulating, but for us, um, thinking with theory needs to actually be productive as well. So we're interested in the so what, I guess, and how that might, this might help us to, to, to think um, about children's digital authoring. Um, and I think the key point that we'd like to make that, that we're, we might return to later is that this particular lens draws attention to, to how objects the app um, and the, the, the tablet play an active part in activating um, Anna's imagination in order to think about children co-authoring um, new possibilities with objects that enchant. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Fiona now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to bring things back to some quite traditional literacy theories. Um, because when I was um, considering what I wanted to say about this particular moment in the data, um, I wanted to respond to the whole series provocation about criticality and critical literacies um, and how that might connect with a moment like this. Um, so I have, have gone back to uh, Bill Green's original 3D model of literacy. 
Um, my work, as you will tell, probably from what I'm saying, continues to draw messily on new materialism and socio-materialism, as well as multimodality and this sort of traditional work of the new literacy scholars. In this exercise, I wanted to focus particularly on the cultural and critical dimensions of literacy as described by Bill Green in 1988. Because in recent work, I found myself thinking more and more about the intertwined cultural and critical dimensions of literacy, particularly in relation to children's in the moment text production and also their text consumption. And I'm really speaking to Guy Merchant and Kathy Burnett's recent prov provocation in their seminar in this series um, around how do we apply critical literacy theory in digital practices where authorship is unclear, distributed across densely woven spaces. Thanks, Becky. Um, so I'm thinking about these um, two dimensions, uh, putting aside the operational for a moment, um, the cultural and the critical dimensions of children's literacy practices. Um, and as Green um, always intended, they are very messily intertwined. So thinking about the cultural, um, I was drawn to Prince Lou's notion of located resources. So the idea that digital technology and the associated literacy resources are taken up and used differently, differently and mean differently in different contexts. And I think this is a useful way for thinking, um, a useful lens for thinking about the role that um, culture plays in very uh, specific ways in the texts that children are producing, um, but also other layers of or other aspects of culture. So thinking about the idea that as they learn to engage with and operate digital technologies, children are also being inducted into particular cultures or sets of uh, cultures. How children relate to digital technologies is implicitly linked then to the cultural contexts these engagements take place within. And in many ways, in many contemporary societies, becoming an effective functioning participant in families and communities really involves learning how to relate to the digital and its use and meaning therein. Thinking about the critical dimension, um, I'm aware that um, in a lot of the way it's used um, in recent sort of recent pub publications, people talk a lot about critical literacy as being um, the ability to analyze texts, identifying, for example, their relation to structures of powers. And I know that this is a really important aspect, but something that I think is sometimes underplayed or less discussed is that Green's model always stressed that there is also a productive uh, dimension to critical literacy. So in his original definition, he said a, a critical stance means providing individuals at any level of schooling with the means to reflect critically on what is being learned and taught and to take an active role in the production of knowledge and meaning. So when I talk about critical digital literacy or media literacy, um, I'm thinking about it as being something that is, yes, um, analytic, it's understanding how power functions within texts, but it's also about taking an active role um, in producing something new on the basis of that understanding and knowledge. Which leads me to this tension, I think, um, between children's digital practices as determined by their immediate environment, so the idea of digital practices being culturally specific, versus children's capacity for doing something new or producing something new. Uh, Becky, if you could move me on. Thank you. So applying this idea in relation to Anna and her family, um, I've talked about this a lot in my past work, the importance of thinking holistically and trying to map out um, the complex things that are contributing um, to in the moment practices. Um, so I'm conceptualising cultural literacy here as how we do things with the digital in our family. And it's impossible to exhaustively map the complex cultural resources that Anna is drawing on. But the holistic analysis we were able to do does reveal family practices in relation to the digital. And I would characterize these in Anna's family as being magical, transformative, playful, mischievous, humorous and experimental. So to give some examples, um, as you can see on the right hand side of this slide, this is Anna sitting in front of a 
YouTube video of a roller coaster. And this is a practice um, that is common in the family. As um, Anna's mum uh, articulates here, we sit on the floor, they sit at the front, I sit at the back. And Anna says, it feels like we're on a real roller coaster. So they're actually physically using these YouTube videos um, and engaging in this um, quite magical practice that is taking something that's perhaps similar to this colouring app could be seen of limited value um, and they're using it in a physical shared family practice that is actually quite magical, enjoyable um, playful. And as Marina says here, um, I think this is really important, there are lots of different roller coasters they could have chosen, but they like to choose this one called uh, the shark roller coaster um, because mum, Marina, is really scared of sharks. And as you can see at the bottom image here, um, the roller coaster takes you on a ride up through this terrifying shark mouth. Um, so bringing in this kind of mischievous aspect, which is also really common in some of the other practices, digital and non-digital, that Anna and her family engage in. Um, so in one of the um, visits, the, the uh, researchers, the field researchers, made a note about the fact that Anna had um, played another trick on them. Um, where she she suddenly called out from her bedroom saying that she was in pain and she'd had an accident with a nail um, and when they came in she had one of these um, I'm sure you will all be familiar with um, nail through the finger tricks on her hand. Um, similarly Anna and her brother do a lot of very playful mischievous things with their Alexa device um, such as asking Alexa to beatbox and asking her deliber deliberately uh, provocative and challenging questions and seeing what the answers are. Becky, if you want to move me on again. Thank you. So thinking about this, clearly um, what Anna is doing in the whale trick very much does draw on these shared family practices. And when I'm thinking about the cultural, I'm thinking primarily in a sort of hyper-local way about her family. Um, but when we look at the critical aspects, we can see that Anna does seem to show this sort of more traditional idea of critical literacy. Um, she's analytical. She, she's aware of the affordances of, app, of the app, importantly, what it does afford, but also what it doesn't afford. Um, so she is able, for example, to paint it the same colours as the whale, um, but it wouldn't actually afford this sort of magic trick that she wants to achieve. Um, so she's also part of a family with, with these established digital habitus. In the moment, this textual production is drawing on both at the same time as she does something new. So it's drawing on the affordances of the app, the, the sort of commercial product. And she's also drawing culturally on what her family do digitally. But she's going beyond that and doing something new, unintended by both the app's designers, but also kind of establishing a new branch in her family's ever evolving media practices. Um, and this really speaks to what I talk about in my thesis um, as being um, the idea that family mediation is often thought about as unidirectional. Um, whereas I think what's happening here is iterative and unidirectional. So if you think about her practices, um, she's learning how things are done culturally in relation to the digital in fam her family and also what they mean at the very same time that she's beginning to transform those practices and meanings through her own unique interactions with the digital. Thanks Becky. I think that's my last slide. So um, we are then going to move on, I know we're running over a little, um, but to, to some cross-cutting um, discussions. Um, so firstly, uh, thinking about the child, um, we kept coming back to the idea of objects and their propensity to enchant, um, primarily children. And we thought about the usefulness of theories of embodiment and affect in recent literacies work to think through some of the things that were coming out around wonder, magic, affect and emotion. Essentially criticality being a useful lens for thinking about children's capacity for creativity, imagination and improvisation beyond what is designed into digital texts and beyond culturally specific digital practices. But also the, the real importance of conceptualizing agency as relational in these discussions. So when we talk about objects and how they enchant children, um, 
an object such as the drawing app, the colouring app, um, becoming suddenly magical, becoming suddenly really um, a wonderful learning resource, but specifically in its intra-relation with Anna in this particular community at this particular time. And I will let Becky speak next. So um, I'm, I'm not going to say very much because I know we're running out of time, but just to say we, we really strongly focused on the um, idea of parental mediation um, and whether we needed to have um, further kind of criteria for understanding that and particularly discuss this idea of an effective kind of form of uh, parental mediation that is full of love and affection and giving the child the floor, um, seeing the child as full of potential and, and able to perform. Um, and I guess we were particularly um, focused on that as something, um, again, just to emphasize that sort of spoke um, in, in a challenge to some of the assumptions made by um, the kind of discourse of learning loss um, about what goes on in some families and, and, and in others and, and what um, a kind of an effective form of mediation can um, make possible um, being something that's really important to explore in terms of extending literacy practices. I'm going to hand over to Liz now uh, just to finish off. Yeah, thank you, Becky and Fiona. So just to draw things um, to, to a close, what we have hoped to do in this session is to make visible where we are as a trio in terms of our, our work in progress, um, where we have um, chosen to, to use the image, I guess, of, of a kaleidoscope to represent the ways in which we have, have sort of turned the kaleidoscope to look in three different ways um, at the one, um, the, the one episode or the one encounter. So what we're really interested in and what might be a, a fruitful, fruitful discussion or a provocation is what happens when these different lenses is, are, are applied. What aspects of, of, of that um, digital authoring are brought into focus and what are blurred? Um, and if we read those three readings together um, in dialogue with each other, um, what new ideas um, open up um, and what tensions maybe are, are produced as well. Um, and um, we've just put a reference there to some work that Fiona's doing with some other colleagues that is a work in, in process um, that, that kind of un unpicks some of these ideas in, in a different context as well. I'm going to stop sharing now and hand back to Annette and Michael. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. That was um, just such a wonderful presentation and really super interesting. And I love the way that you've um, drilled down onto that, that one example um, to really unpack some of these, um, you know, these important questions about um, how we might apply um, materiality as a theory, um, and how it does relate to some of our existing um, theoretical frameworks as well. Um, and, you know, I just love um, the, the example was just so interesting in that Anna um, used this media example as a magic trick. So she completely displaces the notion of kind of media being used um, in a kind of, well, as a, as a form of media for entertainment and, you know, recasts it. As, um, as a magic trick. It's just so so interesting and so creative. And, um, and in fact, you know, the language she uses around that, I think, is, um, is really knowing and distanced and, and shows that she, you know, understands what she's creating and she's treating that artifact as an artifact, which is, which is super interesting. Um, so Fiona, I just wanted to, um, if you don't mind, start with a question for you um, around, critical literacy actually and and the notion of the critical and I think one of the things that's that continues to be interesting is that um, in a way um, materiality I think or you know the new materialism or, or how, however we want to talk about this in some respects kind you know sort of um, brings into question the notion of critical literacy in a way or the notion of critical distance because it's about the performed instance of literacy. It's about um, bringing things into being in that way. And so I just wanted to ask you um, if you could just um, 
talk a little bit more about why you think it's important to continue to focus on critical literacy as a concept as we're exploring children's digital play and creativity and authoring and so on? Yeah, I, I think it was just um, serendipitous, really, that we were asked to contribute to this at a time when I was thinking a lot about uh, critical literacy and and going back to that original definition. And I do think that that um, a sort of original sort of second part to what critical literacy is, is often sort of um, put put to the background really in terms of how people discuss criticality I think so often we focus on it as being a sort of in the same way that probably a lot of our students think when we're asking them to critique we're asking them to sort of say something negative um, that criticality even in this original definition was very much about um, transforming you know drawing on resources to do something new and I think that that connects really nicely with new materialism and it's 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 something that I'm just working through at the moment but I find really exciting yeah thanks yeah no I think um I think all of us are trying to work it out so I think you know one of the things I I guess I'm I reflected on as you were kind of saying you're working your way into this is actually that um you're doing it in a really wonderful way you know and that you're um you're doing it in such a rich way and and it's really kind of um well, it's really generous of you to kind of share the experience of working through it i think it's really helpful and um and and really um terrific for us to hear about um in in relation to that i guess liz i i had a question for you about this kind of idea of of um the three lenses and the kind of kaleidoscope kind of approach and bringing things into focus and then things going out of focus and a, a bit more. But I guess I'll, I'd be interested to know just a little bit more about why you chose these three particular lenses, um, because I guess, um, you know, it might have been possible to choose some other different types of lenses, for instance. So why these three in particular? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I think that partly because they sort of continue some of the work that we've been exploring individually and also as, as a collective. Um, but also perhaps because purposefully, those, although there's some synergies between these three perspectives, there's also some, some theoretical dissonance as well. Um, and I think we've been very conscious of, uh, conscious of that sort of potential dis dissonance um, but rather than see that dissonance as a problem in terms of trying to say, you know, my theory is better than yours, we've actually seen that dissonance as something really positive in that, that dissonance and, and difference can, can be productive and can help us to see, um, to see how putting those different ideas into dialogue with each other can actually be really helpful in terms of enriching our understanding and seeing some of the limitations, but also some of the possibilities of, of, of looking in very different ways at this one episode. So, as I say, um, well, um, I, I was really interested in how Fiona um, framed this idea of sort of drawing messily on different theoretical positions. So recognising that there are some differences, but being sort of quite comfortable with that, actually. Um, and rather than seeing new materialism as this sort of completely new way of thinking about things, recognising actually that um, in some ways it, it's a continuation of a dialogue that's been going on for a long time. Yeah, that's really terrific. And, and I think um, I think the other thing that I really love about um, the way that you frame this is, you know, at a certain point in the presentation, um, you said that... Um, you didn't want to do, do just theory for theory's sake. And I think that, um, you know, in bringing these different lenses and thinking through how these kind of established um, theories that we're familiar with, you know, are in conversation with uh, a new approach um, is really productive, actually. But it's productive be partly because it's, you know, we can think through how this can be applied in very pragmatic ways to kind of really try to understand what's going on in this example, rather than just kind of keep it at the level of theory. So that was really fantastic. Um, so um, just, I guess, a final question from me, and then I do want to hand it over to, um, to um, everyone else to ask questions. But um, Becky, I, I um, was really interested in, um, um, you know, the role of the mum here. You know, it was so interesting um, how she was trying to mediate the conversation or she was trying to explain and so on. 
Um, and, and, you know, she did very much in, engage in that playful um, reenactment of the moment or that, that moment of enchantment um, with the magic trick. So um, can you just say a little bit more about um, how you find new ways to describe the role of the parent in, in co-creating moments of enchantment? And um, yeah, can you just talk a little bit more about that and some of the implications of the findings around that for us, thanks. So um, anybody that, that knows any, any of my work will know that I mostly work in schools and not in early childhood. So um, looking at a home um, event in this way and looking at um, very young children and then their role of parents is, was actually quite new. Um, and ha having worked with Fiona and looked at the way that she um, kind of talked about um, parental mediation and she, she apply, uh, developed various lenses to look at how parental mediation supports play and supports literacy development um, and obviously in her in her doctorate but then also in our in our Lego foundation funded project um, and, but I think what we what we were able to do here um, and having having done this with one moment we're now seeing this um, in in multiple other moments is is some some new ways whether we call it continue to kind of frame it as as mediation um i think it, i think it's a really useful term but we've maybe felt that there was this other aspect that was missing um that positions the child as expert full of potential um and uh you know and i'm and i don't think we can obviously we're not saying this is associated with particular kinds of socioeconomic family um, practices necessarily because we haven't looked at the data to do that yet but what I def definitely think we can say is that it challenges the kind of really prevalent assumptions I'd be really interested to know if these are true of Australia too but really prevalent assumptions that um, so-called kind of working class families where you know this is a a, a, a a mom who is at home is is on benefits and is um you know the classic kind of single parent stereotype doing some of the most interesting um kind of supporting and facilitating of play that that we saw across the whole of the of the research and and for me with my lens of somebody that's looking at text production later on when they're getting to primary school, I'm seeing that as hugely scaffolding. Um, so to connect with um, what Fiona was saying about the kind of production of text. So this is, um, Anna is, is understanding how texts are constructed. She's going behind, you know, under the bumper, behind the scenes. She's, she's deconstructing in order to kind of recreate this moment. And each time they obviously do this, it, it kind of develops even further. So, um, I guess so I was very driven by that kind of um, anxiety that I had that was the kind of current discourse and I think this is something that was interesting to you know to bring to the table was the fact that we are also influenced by you know when we go back to data by what's kind of currently happening as well. Yeah and I think that's that's really um, so so interesting and yes I think we'd find very similar discourses in the Australian context too. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so Annette, I'm going to hand back to you now to um, for any general questions from the audience. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, so thank you so much, um, Fiona and Liz and Becky, who I should probably just note are, are all from the University of Sheffield. Since I forgot to introduce you at the beginning of the session, and I will apologise for that. Um, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Um, I was wondering why I had this extra little page sitting here on the side, only to realise once you got started <laughs> that that's what had occurred. Um, I think, you know, you've really wrapped up, I think, so nicely around the notion of of moving from, you know, ways that we've understood literacy or, or different theories that we've brought to text production and text um, consumption around, you know, and, and through um, into the new literacies and new literacy scholars. And, you know, you've just been talking so much, Becky, just in that last response around, you know, things that link so nicely with um, Shirley Bryce Heath's, Heath's work um, with Ways With Words. And for me, you know, and, and how that might move then into new um, materialism, for me, that really kind of wraps up the challenge that I think we're all having as we start to think about these new ways around what does it mean to actually decenter the human but not devalue the human, particularly when we're engaging with, you know, young children or with children in either schools or home contexts. So, you know, you've really framed up for me, I think, some some other ways of responding to those those challenges and um, um, and queries that I know that 
all of us that are engaging in this kind of space are thinking about. I don't actually have any questions that people have, um, have put into um, the chat, but if somebody would like to put their hand up, they're very welcome. I do actually have you all on the screen this time. So um, if we probably have time for one more question before we finish off. So if there's somebody who would like to um, put their camera on and join us for a question, that would be great. Otherwise, I'm going to fill the space again. So. Look at that, you've stunned them. <laughs> um, well, we haven't given them enough time and apologies for the for the delay and my my inefficient slide moving across. But Annette, that really is helpful, that notion of I love the way that you frame that of the decentering the human but not not kind of enabling you're not allowing that to devalue really helpful because I think when we're engaged with young children in that I mean we've all done and all of our work works in this area where we actually try to see you know the capacity of of children to actually you know live their lives and be managers within their own lives um, and to manage their lives in you know imaginative ways in creative ways um, and so you know that that is a consistent tension isn't it as we start to try to um, decenter that whole notion around what does it mean to be engaging in spaces in particular, you know, temporal notions, but also with materials. So I'm going to say thank you very much to the three of you. Thank you for joining our conversation. You've just added, you know, so much to um, the conversations that we've had um, over the last few weeks. Um, I know that Lisa Kirvin, um, Michael and myself in, in um, coming together to curate this session, um, we're really wanting to try and make sure that they did um, link together and, and produce some kind of space where we could do some, you know, an interesting narrative, but where we could also be really challenging different ideas. So thank you so much also, Fiona, for, for linking back and thinking about past um, presentations as well. Um, we've been doing that in between times. So um, it was wonderful to actually um, actually see that. Tamara, I see that you just um, have added something. If you'd like to just um, put that response forward as we finish off, you'd be very welcome to. Tamara? Sure. Sorry, I didn't think I wasn't going to come back on. But yeah, it was, as I said, it's not a question. It was just really a comment. I just like the way that enchantment or magic was was worked into that and as something that could be captured, not just as a description of a way of describing a thing, but was an experience that brought the parent and potentially the interviewer into that space in a really interesting way. And I think that's something that would get lost in so many other frameworks for capturing or describing that that moment or that experience. So I just thought, that was really, I liked that a lot. And I thought it was a really interesting way of seeing uh, a kid's literacies developing in a way that we wouldn't use those words. But magic is such a good word for that idea of being excited to know something. Yeah. And really brings to the fore, I think, the relationality and what it actually means to not think about those things as nouns, but to actually think about them um, as part of practices and processes. Um, and to think about, you know, what does it actually mean? Enchantment to actually be, be becoming enchantment is um, is interesting, I think. Thank you so much from uh, Lisa and from Michael and myself for joining us. We hope that many of you will come back and join us on the 18th, um, and uh, for which will be our final um, seminar in this particular series, um, which really has been, as I said, to try and um, think about um, querying and what does it actually mean to be thinking and, and theoretically um, and conceptually bringing ideas around socio-materiality two notions around uh, literacy and text production and text um, construction. I will ask everybody perhaps to turn their cameras on for a moment just so these Zoom sessions are just so lonely, aren't they, with black square boxes there. So if you wouldn't mind putting your cameras on and indicating um, to our presenters, to Fiona and Liz and to Becky, just how much we've appreciated that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll finish there right on six. And as I said, hopefully uh, see you in um, on the 18th of November as well. So thank you very much for coming in. <laughs>